Okay, we're in a new section today in Matthew. We're picking up Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. And we'll be looking at the next four or so verses over the next couple of days. And asking, where does Jesus fit in with the law? And what is Jesus' view of the law? And I'd just like to begin today by asking you a question. And that question is, do you think that we as Christians should keep the Sabbath? Now, before I answer that question, I need to clarify what the Sabbath is. I know there are some Christians out there who refer to Sunday as the Sabbath, and that for some is just a turn of phrase, but for some it reflects a particular point of view. However, if you look carefully at the Ten Commandments, there is simply no question that there is a Sabbath and that Saturday is the Sabbath. Now, before any of you maybe get a bit upset or want to jump down my throat, let me remind you that the Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments and we are called to keep the Sabbath holy. And if you break it, well, it seems that you're breaking a commandment. So does that create a dilemma in your mind? Should we be meeting on a Saturday? Should we be changing our Sunday school and calling it Saturday school? Now, this issue of the Sabbath is just one example of the whole subject of our relationships as Christians to the Mosaic law, to the law given to Moses. Is this a variation in the law that applies to us as Christians? Well, for the answer to that question and all the other questions that come out of this issues, let's look at what Jesus says about the law of Moses here in Matthew in his Sermon on the Mount. Now we're going to spend two episodes looking at this issue. So first I'm going to read the entire passage and then we're going to unpack it together and as usual I shall return again back to the text and we'll look at it in some detail one verse at a time. Because this is important stuff as it looks at what it means to be a Christian and what if any are the requirements for us under the Old Testament laws. So I'd like to begin by picking up the text where we left off last time, which is Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 17. And this is Jesus, of course, speaking. And he says, Do you think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets? I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law, till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men, so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, in this passage, Jesus has just finished this attention-grabbing introduction to his Sermon on the Mount. He's talked about the blessings that come to us if we develop certain characteristics and attitudes and the blessings that we might receive if we live that way and do that. But now here he comes down to the subject, the main subject of his sermon itself. And as I've already suggested, there is a summary overview text to what this sermon is all about. And it's found here actually in verse 20. I'll just remind you of it. He said, Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall no way enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus here is about to introduce and discuss the main subject of his message, which is about righteousness. But remember, in the context of the day in which Jesus lived, if he's about to discuss righteousness, he has to discuss the law. Because the popular opinion of his day is that you were made righteous by keeping the law, the law of Moses. That was how you obtained righteousness, at least according to the prevailing view of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. So in that context, Jesus here comes along And he seems to be suggesting something completely different. I mean, if you listen carefully to what he's previously said, we saw way back in chapter 3 that he came announcing that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. So it's already sounded like he's doing something new. And then we see that he performs miracles. And remember, nobody had done miracles in the land of Israel for hundreds and hundreds of years. 
As a matter of fact, miracles didn't really happen very often in the Old Testament at all, which covered a period of over 2,000 years. So he's already operating in a different way to that of just following the rules of the Mosaic Law. So clearly Jesus is coming with something new. So what does that mean in relation to the Law of Moses? If he is doing something new, where is it going to fit in alongside the law of Moses? And that's the sort of tension that form a backdrop, not only to his statement here, but his whole teaching about righteousness that is going to follow. All right, let's hear what he actually says. And the first thing he says, and we're back at the start of the text, well, it's really simple, it's straightforward. He says, do not think I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Now this word destroy actually means to overthrow or annul or completely invalidate. So does that mean that well, we're going to need to keep those laws if he's not destroying them? There's no way any of us can keep the Mosaic law today. I mean it required that you took a lamb down to the temple and sacrificed it. And today even the Jews don't have a temple anymore. Can we then replace the Jewish temple with a Christian church or tabernacle? What can and what can't we still do today? Which does he mean? Did Jesus come to destroy the law? No, it says he came to fulfill it. So what does that statement actually mean? Clearly, some of the practices of the law have been changed already. So did he change the food laws? Let me remind you that according to the food laws, those of the Old Testament, we're not supposed to eat pork, rabbit or shellfish like lobster or prawns. I know you might not have rabbit very often, but many people would eat a lobster if they could afford it. And if not lobster, well, many would certainly eat prawns these days. Many Christians are also very happy and at peace about eating pork. So clearly, something changed. Something changed around the rules about the consumption of food. Now, we'll go into this issue in much more depth in when we get into the book of Acts. But what the New Testament appears to have done and what Jesus appears to say here is change the practice around some of the laws. But here Jesus is saying, I did not come to destroy the law. I didn't come to nullify the question. So when you hear that statement, does that bother you? You see, if you're reading the scripture thoughtfully, that statement should really pop that question into your head. It really should grab your attention. What does Jesus do here with the law if he isn't actually going to destroy it? Well, let me give you one possible way, the way some Christians try and solve this problem. And they do so by dividing the law into three parts. They say there was the moral law, which was the Ten Commandments. They then talk about the civil law, which was all those things to do with things like divorce and carrying things on the Sabbath and all that sort of thing. And then there was the ceremonial law, the ideas about taking animals down to the site of the temple and making sacrifices and so forth. Now, what some say is what Jesus did is that he fulfilled the ceremonial and the civil law, but we still come under the moral law. And that does, on first hearing, sound like a quite a nice, neat little answer. But there are a couple of problems with that answer, that perspective. For starter, nowhere in the Bible does it say that the Mosaic law is broken down in this way. And nowhere in the New Testament does it say that Jesus fulfilled this part or that part of the law and not another. So this distinction, although useful, is something that theologians have created to help us see how the law applies in different areas of our lives and societies. But it's not something you can find structurally in the plain text of the scriptures. The second problem with this view is found in the fact that Jesus says in the very next verse, he says, For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Sure sounds to me like he's saying the Mosaic law still stands in some way. None of it's been done away by him. It also doesn't sign to me like he's saying we just need to fulfill this part of it or that part and let another part pass. Signs to me like he's saying none of it is going to be written off. And then that brings us to a third problem, which is a huge one, one that seems inescapable to me for people who hold this perspective, is the fact that in some ways the laws of Moses still apply. Well, surely then that must include the Sabbath. 
If we just read Exodus 20, the Sabbath is clearly on the seventh day. So if you're one of those people who subscribe to the idea that the moral law still applies completely, then you're still under the moral law and one of those Ten Commandments means you're obligated to worship on Saturday the Sabbath. Now I wonder have I created enough tension in your mind to say that you really want an answer for this once and for all. Well, that's what I'm going to try and do over these next couple of days. And what I want to point out is Jesus is emphatic that he did not come to destroy the law. Well, if he didn't come to destroy it, then what did he come to do? Well, listen very carefully again to what that first verse says. He said in verse 17, he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or title will pass away. So the law is not going to be destroyed or pass away. It's going to be fulfilled. Now, I'm sure you've heard this idea of a jot or tittle before. But just to remind you, these were the very small, in some cases, the little tiny pen strokes which just form parts of a Hebrew letter. The closest thing we have in the English language is the dot above an I or the stroke across the letter L that will turn it into a T. It was that small part of a letter that could sometimes change the meaning of a letter or a word that Jesus is talking about here. In Hebrew, those little markings could change the meaning of the whole world. So Jesus here is saying nothing is going to be passed over. Nothing is going to be changed from the law. Not one sentence, not one syllable, not even the most minute part of it until it has been fulfilled. But now we find that Jesus himself says he is the one who has come to fulfill the law. So did Jesus fulfill the law? And if so, how did he fulfill the law? That's the really big question here. The civil and the ceremonial laws, there is obviously a difference between those kind of laws, between how they function then and how we approach those things today. But what about the moral law? What about the Ten Commandments? Well, let me show you how I think the Bible teaches that Jesus fulfilled the whole law. He was, as a man, subject to the law, just the same as you and I. But we are told he did not sin. So Jesus fulfilled the moral law by living a perfect life without sin. But Jesus also fulfilled the ceremonial law. People previously would have had to bring a lamb to the tabernacle, etc. And in doing so, they were fulfilling the Mosaic injunction. But remember what John the Baptist said when Jesus appeared for the first time. Behold, he said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So that original sacrifice of a lamb was just a picture, if you will. It was a type of something greater that was to come. It is what is called typology. And the type that it was pointing to was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It was made complete in him, which is what the word fulfilled actually means. Under the Old Testament law, the sacrifice for sin was settled one sacrifice at a time, sacrifice by sacrifice, sin by sin. But Jesus comes along here and he fulfills the requirement of the law for sacrifice in its entirety by being a sacrifice for the whole world, for the whole sins of the world. And he fulfilled the ceremonial law by being a sacrifice for sinful humankind once and for all. And he also fulfills the civil law, particularly here, in that he teaches us to love one another. And then in essence he issues these injunctions in the Beatitudes concerning our characters and how we should develop our characters in order to have relationship with one another, which is what the civil law was actually all about. And he also fulfilled the prophet. As a matter of fact, this passage in Matthew, it actually talks about filling the law and the prophets in the sense that the prophets, they prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. And clearly Jesus was the fulfillment of that. Now, granted, some of the prophecies have not yet been fully fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That will be completed when he comes in his second coming. But my point is very simply this. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Every aspect of everything is prophesied. Everything that was demanded by the law of Moses, Christ Jesus fulfilled it. And that's why he is able to make the statement, I did not come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill it. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law 
or to say the same thing another way, everything in the Old Testament, including the law of Moses, points to Jesus Christ himself. We're all familiar with that very famous painting of Leonardo da Vinci of the Last Supper. I wonder if you can conjure it up in your mind. I've actually used it as an image for this week's podcast artwork. And in it, Jesus is the central figure. But if you look at the painting carefully, you will see that da Vinci masterfully and artistically arranges everything in that picture so it points towards Christ. The fingers of the apostles are pointing towards Christ. The beams in the ceiling are all coming to focus on Christ. So Leonardo, his purpose in painting that picture was to draw our attention to Christ. Well, in a similar fashion, everything in the Old Testament is constructed in such a way as to point to the coming of Christ. Now I've only talked about one tiny tip of the iceberg here today. There's much, much more. But believe me, friends, the entire Old Testament, I believe, points to the coming of a Messiah. And any sincere believing Jew actually still believes that also. Now they won't necessarily recognize that the Messiah has arrived in Christ Jesus, but they know that is the purpose of the Old Testament. Jesus came to fulfill what was written in the law and the prophets. But does that leave us with a bit of a contradiction here? How can we refill something without destroying something? Well, maybe I have a little illustration which can help. Let's suppose I have an acorn and I take a hammer and I hit it and squash it. Would I have destroyed the acorn? I think if most of us looked at it, I think we would say, yes, I probably did. But suppose I took that acorn and I put it in the ground and left it for years and it grew into an oak. Did I in fact destroy it or did it grow into something greater? Did it grow into something greater? In fact, the very thing that the acorn was meant to become and flourish into? Well, that I believe is what Jesus' relationship with the law is. So Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law. I have come to fulfill it. Now, At this point, I'm just going to say, fasten your seatbelts, because this has some really interesting, really practical ramifications. Amazing ramifications, I would say, for us. This means that for us as Christians, we are no longer under the law. We are not under the Mosaic law, and we are not under the condemnation of that law. Now, sometimes when I've taught around this subject in the past, I can see people in the congregation get a bit nervous and say, I can figure that they're asking themselves, well, what does that mean? Well, Romans chapter 6 says it's very clearly, probably as clearly as any passage in the Bible, but there are many who talk about this. But for example, Romans 6 verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So we're not under the law, but we're under something else called grace. So having established that Jesus fulfilled the law, then those that accept him as saviour now come under his righteousness and we're no longer under the law, we're no longer under condemnation of us. Now if you were to read the book of Galatians, if you have time, the whole point of the book of Galatians and the reason Paul wrote it was to say that we're not under the law and that we're under grace and he tries to unpack that and explain it for us. And I highly recommend, if you've got some time before we get to it, in a year's two time that you take a look at. And then there's other passages, like specifically Colossians 2 verse 16, which tells us, not only in relation to the law, but in relation to that first question I asked at the beginning of this session, is where it tells us, let no one judge you in food or drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. So the New Testament is saying, yes, you're not under the law, now you're under, under something called grace. And for those of you getting a bit nervous because you think, well, if you're telling people that they're not under law, are you saying they can do anything they want? If you don't know Christ, you certainly are still under the law. But if you do know Christ, you are under a law, but not the Mosaic law, because now you're under the law of Christ. Whose law? the law of Christ, and the law of Christ is the law of love. Now, does that mean you can go out and murder and do anything you want? Can you steal, rob and lie and break all these other commandments in the knowledge that you are forgiven? Now, interestingly, under the law of Christ, there are 10 commandments which are repeated 
not only in the Beatitudes, but elsewhere. But you know what? If you look really closely, you can see one of those commandments is now missing. One that addresses the condition of our heart rather than our external acts of religious righteousness. So can you guess which one of the commandments is missing? Well, if you want to know, you'll have to come back tomorrow and I'll tell you. Okay, here we go. We're picking up again in Matthew chapter 5, today looking at 19 and 20, and thinking about what Jesus teaches and his view of the law of Moses is. Now, I suggested last time, yesterday, that as Christians we now fall under a greater, a more perfect law, the law of Christ, which does not, as some suggest, replace the Old Testament law, it fulfills it. Now, that sounds the same thing, but it isn't quite the same thing at all. Under the laws of Christ, nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated, not only here in the Beatitudes that we looked at recently, but also elsewhere. But have you noticed, or did you know, that one of those commandments is not addressed or referred to under the law of Christ? Can, can you guess which one is missing? Well, if you noticed in his teaching in the Beatitudes that Jesus said nothing about keeping the Sabbath, now, the reason he did this, because the essence of the whole of the New Testament and what he's teaching us now, is now teaching us something different. It's telling us that we are now under grace. We are now under what is sometimes called the law of love. And if you follow that law, you will by nature fulfill the moral law, because that which was a set of religious rules and regulations based around worship and atonement through sacrifice have now been replaced by the one time, once and for all, sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we now fall under his law of love and grace. No passage better sums this up for us than probably Romans chapter 13. Beginning in verse 8, I'll read a few verses for you. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandment, you shall not acquit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covered, and whatever other commandment there may be, are all summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to your neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of of the law. Now the law given to Moses as we see here it said things like do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, don't lie and in a sense we still of course should live that way and keep those rules. But the New Testament now says that you are no longer under the Mosaic law judicially anymore because we now come under the law of Christ in regard to living this way. And Paul here points out that the only thing we need to remember is simply to love one another. And Paul is pointing out and arguing that if we understand this, if we truly understand this, and we are truly loving one another the way God wants us to, the way God loved us, then we're automatically going to fulfill the law anyway. You see, if I truly love you, then I'm not going to kill you, am I? If I love you, I'm not going to steal your property or take your wife or ruin your reputation? Of course not. But the big issue is, we're now under grace, which is why Hebrews 4 verse 16 tells us that we can approach God in a new way. 4.16 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So what we have in the law of Christ is the grace and the power to do what he has said and be how we should be in the future, knowing that when it comes the time where we approach the throne of grace, we can come in confidence because we do it not in our own merit, but in the merit of Christ. And as we live this life, God will give us the grace to not only fulfill the law, but to love other people, even those who have sinned or offended against us. We are now able to keep the law because we no longer have to try and do it in our own strength. Now we can depend on the grace of God to forgive us when we trip up, 
And just as we know we have been forgiven, we are thereby enabled and empowered to forgive others. Jesus later in this book will say that the greatest commandment is to love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbour as yourself. So as far as Christ was concerned, this whole thing about the law is now bound up and sealed under the law of love because that gives us the ability to live that way and the ability to do that is given to us as a gift of grace by God himself. So let's just return to this main text in Matthew that we're looking at and I'll pick up and read for you verses 19 and 20 which tells us, and remember this is Jesus himself speaking, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one or the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So please note that this is the conclusion, the summary statement and conclusion of all his teachings up to this point. And it is saying that we are no longer under the law of Moses. Rather, we can now fulfill the law of Moses because all the big issues that law pointed out have been dealt with by the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, the two main issues are actually addressed here specifically in these verses the two main things that rise out of that and i'm going to try and deal with them both today and finish that off today but i'm going to do it if you'll allow me in reverse order in verse 20 it said except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness described by the pharisees then in no way will you enter the kingdom of heaven so the issue in verse 20 is about entering the kingdom of heaven what's the criteria for it But then the previous verse in verse 19 is not about getting there. Everybody in that verse is seen to be there in the kingdom of heaven. It's about being whether you're considered the least or the greatest in that kingdom. So everybody is there in verse 19. And it's talking about how those things are for those in the kingdom. And verse 20 is talking about how to get there in the first place. So I'm going to deal with these two issues in reverse order. Because I think it's helpful to talk first about how we get there before we talk about what it will be like when we get there. So how do we gain the kingdom? Well, it seems to me you have to have a righteousness that is greater than the one that was being taught by the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And that's what he's pointing out. Now, these guys who were the religious leaders of that time, they put a great emphasis on the external obedience to the laws given to Moses. And in the next episode, we're going to look at what they said. And we're going to look at what they said versus what Jesus said. But just to give you a quick example, Jesus is going to say things like, you've heard it said that you shall not murder. I say unto you, if you have already hated people in your heart, you've committed murder already. So the point Jesus will be making is that you're going to need more than this religious external type of righteousness taught by the scribes and the Pharisees. You're going to need to have a new type of internal righteousness. And don't think just because you can say, oh, I've never murdered anybody. Jesus say, well, that's not quite the case. If you've held hate in your heart, then you've already broken that commandment. So this is a much higher standard, isn't it? And he will be seen to apply it across several of the commandments as an illustration of this. And in doing so, he will tell us now that this new highest standard is going to be the one that we're going to be measured against. A standard which points out that there is no one righteous, no not one, when measured against the internal standard, we are all seen to come short of the glory of God. But don't worry, he will point out how we can have victory in that. So although it appears to get worse, because it points out the fact that we are all sinners, and now it also points out that the penalty of our sin is death, But it only gets worse because it's going to get better because the New Testament and Jesus and all the writings of the New Testament will tell us that Jesus Christ's 
God's Son, died and paid the penalty for our sins, paid the debt of our sins, and even rose from the dead in order that we too might rise to the dead and have access to the kingdom of heaven. The New Testament teaches us that by simply trusting in Christ, you are declared righteous by God. In fact, that's the entire purpose of some books of the Bible. It's the entire purpose of the book of Romans, for example. In fact, the first five chapters of that book focus entirely on this thing called justification by faith. And the word justification means to be declared righteous. But it gets even better because we're not only declared righteousness, we are gifted, imputed, the biblical word is, with the very righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. It tells us in Romans 5.21, For he made him, that's God, made him, and he who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, in Jesus Christ, we can stand before God in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So in order to enter the kingdom of God now, all you have to do is have the righteousness that he had, which is greater than any righteousness taught by any scribe, Pharisee, or even any religious leader today. We just have to trust in him as our own personal saviour not ourselves. We don't trust in ourselves anymore. We trust in him and thereby we gain the righteousness, the holiness of Jesus Christ and the right to stand before God. How absolutely straightforward is this? How perfect is this? It's simply saying it takes nothing else than recognizing that you are not good enough and that you have not lived a life without sin. And by simply accepting that, by simply accepting that your salvation cannot come from somewhere within yourself, it has been imputed to you from outside yourself by God himself through Jesus, that that is how he has made you right with him. To me that makes perfect sense. In that salvation, of course it must lie within God himself the perfect God, the one who created us, because he is the only one who can atone for the sin. We can't do it for ourselves. Knowing that it's not our own moral uprightness or some code of decency that comes from obeying a bunch of man-made laws is the thing that makes us right with God. It's the key here. Being made right with God comes by simply trusting in Jesus Christ and presenting his perfect life and his ministry as a substitution for our own shortcomings. Now this may come as quite a challenge to some people who have not heard the Bible taught in this way because they've lived in a tradition where they felt that their salvation relied within the religious organisation. That still goes on to this day. But let me show you another passage that clearly states that this is the case. Paul here is speaking about himself and he's comparing his own moral righteousness with that of Jesus Christ. And right at the beginning of this chapter, he talks about all that he has to his own credit, religious-wise, and how he has kept the law. Well, just listen to what he says. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. And then he says, though I might have thought I have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks that they have confidence in the flesh, then I even more so. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew among Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted. I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which in the law, I was blameless. So what he's talking here about is his previous legal external righteousness that he felt he had by following the rules as a Pharisee. But then he says how oh, you've got to have more than that to gain access to the kingdom of heaven. Listen, he continues. But what things were these that were gained to me? These I have now counted for loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And now count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having any of my own righteousness, which was from the law, 
but that which now comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. You see, there are two possible options. You can stand before God and say, look what I've done and how I've lived my life. You may even stand there and say, look, I've not killed anybody. I didn't rob a bank. Well, what you have there in those regard is you have the righteousness of the law in regard to those particular commandments. But Jesus is saying, that's not the measure anymore. It's not the standard you have to have. It's a greater righteousness that you need to have and to seek. Now you have to have the righteousness that comes from God himself through Jesus Christ. Because you were clothed, he says, in other words, you appear before God now in his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. Then and only then will you be able to enter into the kingdom of God. And it's not because of anything that you did, it's because of what Jesus did. So like Jesus himself said in verse 20, unless your righteousness surpasses that that is taught by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. It takes a much greater type of righteousness than that to enter the kingdom of heaven. So let's now drop back into Matthew chapter 5, 19 and find out what it will be like when we get there. And it says, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I want you to notice this is a difficult, but it's a fascinating verse. So we now know how we gain heaven by the righteousness of Christ, not of our own making. But what happens if we break the Mosaic laws now? We know that if we don't know Jesus and we break the law, we are still judged under the old law and the judgment for sin under that law is death and internal separation from God. But here in this verse, it's clearly talking about people who have already entered the kingdom and it's talking about their being the greatest and the least. So anyone who comes along and says to you that as a Christian, if you fall back into sin, you lose your salvation. Well, you can tell them that they're wrong and you can quote this verse to them. There are, of course, consequences for sin, not only in this life, but also in the life to come. Those who teach that if you break the law and sin as a believer, you will not gain heaven. Well, that's just not correct, according to this passage and many, many others. If you mess up now, you don't fall under the Mosaic law, the law of Moses. You now fall under the law of Christ and the law of love. And you will be positioned in heaven according to the standard that you set and how you are judged other people in this life. And this passage tells us that there are some who are going to be called great in the kingdom of God and some less so. Now, when we get later into this Gospel of Matthew, we will witness a huge debate between Jesus and the Apostle about who is going to be great in the kingdom. And Jesus will deal with that discussion, and I'll teach him that at some length later. But it's worth saying he's simply going to say it's the exact opposite of what you guys think it's going to be. He will clearly teach in this book and others that the greatest in the kingdom will be those who are the least in the world, meaning the servants of others. And that the true service of other people in God, in love, is nothing more than showing an expression of God's love to everybody else we come into contact with. So if you understand this passage in the context of the book of Matthew, in the context of the New Testament, and in the context of the Bible, you fulfill the laws now, not by keeping a set of religious rules and rituals, but by loving and serving and putting other people first. Why should that be a mystery to so many people? including Christians, sadly. How obvious it is, how can they not see that when God came down and he walked the earth and he did what he did, how can they not see that that's how, what we should be doing also? The law of Christ means that now, by God's grace, we are declared righteous and by trusting in Christ, we are able to build your life upon his example, 
now but the beauty of it is you don't have to go out there and do it in your own effort we're also given the gift of the holy spirit where that we are truly able to love people just like he loved people now on some occasions that love of christ the love that we express will appear very different to the type of love the world expects the world loves to define what love is and they usually do it by cobbling together a few moral statements, mix it in with a few religious rules, and if that wasn't bad enough, they like to throw in a few man-made rules of their own. And they try and put you under a way of living that is just another man-made type of law. But two things always happen to people who try and live that way. One is, they find they can't do it. You can't live under any law or moral system because we are not perfect people. We are sinful human beings with a sinful human nature. What usually happens is that people fall short and then they usually become demotivated and give up trying or they feel guilty all the time because there seems to be no possible way for a tone for the fact that they aren't perfect and they can't meet the standard. Or the second thing that happens, the more dangerous things that happens, the thing that makes them less likely to find a way through this perspective is they drop off all humility and they kid themselves that they're doing fine. And they walk around thinking, because I do these things now I am righteous. And it changes the direction of their lives from seeking internal righteousness to showing off external righteousness to other people. And that will change someone's whole attitude and personality. And it's in opposite direction of travel in life than what God wants us to take. But if you understand the law of love, and you understand that you come before God with nothing of your own, remember that from the Beatitude, it's about coming before him poor in spirit, knowing that without Christ we have no righteousness of our own and no hope in heaven. It's about that internal attitude that God is after, an attitude of gratitude and dependence upon him. And remember, he now is the one who pleads for us before the throne of God. As an a quick aside, he's already doing that now for us today. When we fall short in our living in this world, in this life, or when we get things wrong. Because as the resurrected, ascended saviour in heaven, we are told he is constantly interceding on our behalf before his father God. Living under the law of loves means we are now able to allow Christ to pay for the debt that we have accumulated by trying to live our life under our own religious or moral code prior to knowing and accepting him as the saviour and the one who can pay that debt. I wonder if any of you out there have ever owned the Inland Revenue. Have you ever owed the Inland Revenue money? And I wonder if any of you have ever waited to the last possible minute before you paid that, before you wrote the check or made that payment. You see, when you do that, you meet the demands of the law, but your heart isn't really in it, is it? But friends, God is not the tax man. If we're living by the external laws, you might put things off to the last minute, and when you do come before God, you're in a sense coming before him begrudgingly. But in doing that, in delaying that, you're missing out on what God's plans are for you and the blessings he wants to give you today in the kingdom, as taught here in this passage. So if you really understand what grace is all about, then you can settle that debt of sin before God immediately, today. And if you haven't done it yet, then do it today, friends, and do it with a heart of gratitude. Do it by trusting in Jesus Christ and him alone as the one who not only paid for the debt for your sins and shortcomings, but granted you forgiveness when you stand before the throne of grace.